And Lord, that is our prayer, that you would send revival to us as individuals, corporately as a church, and our nation, that we might turn back to thee, O Lord, and be a righteous nation. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning, if you have your Bibles and want to look at the text with me, I invite you to turn to the Old Testament book of Micah, the book of Micah. Short little book in the middle of your Bible. You may have to start in the uh, table of contents, but that's okay. I'll be looking in Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. And the title of the message today is, This Issue of Justice, What Is It? And What Does It Mean? This Issue of Justice, What Does It Mean? And I want to read Micah Beginning in verse 6 of chapter 6, read verse 6, 7, and 8. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearly calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This issue of justice what does it mean? You know, a lot of times we use words in an incorrect way. And sometimes we do it and everybody knows what we mean. And, but we, for example, a person may say when they're out of everything, they may say, I don't have nothing. But think about it. What do you have if you don't have nothing? Uh, some of y'all never thought about it, I can tell. Uh, well, here's another one. Somebody says, I feel nauseous. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you feel nauseous, then that means you're making other people want to throw up. Because the right word to say is, I feel nauseated. If you feel nauseous, then you might ought to check yourself. Uh, so I can tell that y'all haven't thought these words through. Uh, uh, let me give you one that I think you can understand. Suppose we use the word toad. Toad. If I said toad right now. Now, y'all got various ideas of what I'm talking about. For example, if somebody jabs you in the ribs with their big toe, you just got towed. <laughs> but if there's a frog sitting on your porch, that's a different toad. And if your car breaks down on the side of the road, you don't want to get towed in the ribs and you don't want to call a frog. You want to call a truck because you need to be towed. And so you understand those are three words that sound the same, but they have entirely different meanings. And I give you that humorous, I hope it was humorous, uh, use of words because there's a lot of talk about justice these days and social justice, social justice. However, justice does not mean the same thing to everybody the way it's being used today. We hear about social justice. You hear about it today in political speeches. Uh, the media talks a lot about social justice and uh, we hear it in social settings, in conversation, people talk about it. There's a multitude of sermons on YouTube and preachers today, and many of them are probably giving sermons on social justice. However, the term that is being used today for social justice and biblical justice 
have completely different meanings. And so uh, there is different as being towed in the ribs. And so uh, we want to look at social justice and biblical justice. The central truth this morning is God expects his people to act according to biblical justice and mercy. God expects us to act with biblical justice and mercy. And so this text that I read to you this morning, it is a popular text that is being preached today to promote the idea of social justice. For example, do justice and love kindness or mercy and walk humbly with your God. That's a, that's a strong text. But uh, we need to see if we can understand what Micah the prophet is telling us to do. Because this justice is huge in the Bible. I read in the scripture reading where Jeremiah told the kings and the officials that came through the gate to do justice. And justice is, a, is the normal, uh, uh, it's a normal thing in the Old Testament. And the prophets declared that it is right and necessary for the kings to administer justice. And so, as we think about justice, we all recognize and have no problem uh, defining injustice. For example, if you've been waiting in a long line and somebody breaks that line and gets ahead of you, you automatically just said, or just in your mind, defined injustice. Because you said, it ain't fair. He can't do that. That's wrong. We all recognize injustice. Uh, probably one of the gravest illustrations of injustice would be when the Nazis murdered millions of Jewish people through the Holocaust just because they were Jewish people. And so we see that. We say it's unjust. It's unfair. It even makes us angry to see injustice. And then how about if somebody gets convicted falsely on wrong evidence in a crime and uh, gets, gets put, sentenced to, to, to jail. John Grissom is uh, uh, a popular uh, author today, and uh, I read one of his books, and uh, uh, it's, it's about the it's called The Innocent Man. And when I read it, it kind of made me think, rethink my, my position on capital punishment because uh, it's about a fellow named Ron Williamson who was a promising uh, up-and-coming uh, baseball player. And uh, the problem was he suffered from a brain disorder, and it slowly and gradually got worse until he, was, uh, he lost his career, and he ended up wandering on the streets over in Missouri. And there was a terrible murder that happened in the city, and uh, uh, they couldn't find anybody to blame it on, and so they blamed him for it. And uh, he was convicted of that crime, and he was sentenced to death uh, by the electric chair. And he spent many years on death row uh, through multiple abusive situations there. And then just hours before he was sentenced to die, uh, they discovered through DNA that he was actually an innocent man. And uh, he was let out of prison, uh, but uh, because of all the things that he suffered, uh, he died an early death and uh, uh, I read that story, and we see things like that, and we say, that's not just. It's unjust. So we, we like justice. We crave justice. We demand justice, and we want justice. And so uh, what is justice? First off, I want to look at this idea today of social justice. You hear this term all the time, and what does it mean? I copied a little definition, uh, but I'll elaborate a little bit. Uh, social justice, how is the term used, and what do many people that are using this term mean? Well, I wanted to understand it, and I wanted a good definition, so I did what everybody does. I Googled it, and uh, <laughs> this, is, this is what came up, the very first definition. Social justice is justice in terms of distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. Now, that's, that's just a raw definition. Another definition was, social justice may be broadly understood as the fair and compassionate 
distribution of the fruits of economic growth. That's according to the United Nations. Uh, here's a little bit longer one, but follow with me. Historically and in theory, the idea of social justice is that all people should have equal access to wealth, health, well-being, justice, privileges, and opportunity regardless of their legal, political, economic, or other circumstances. In modern practice, social justice revolves around favoring or punishing different groups of the population, regardless of any individual's choice or actions based on value judgments regarding historical events, current conditions, and group relations. In economic terms, this means redistribution of wealth, income, and economic opportunities from groups within social justice advocates considered to be oppressors to those who are oppressed. Social justice is often associated with identity politics, socialism, and revolutionary communism. Now we're getting close to what's being mean, meant by social justice. Some of the top issues that are concerned to social justice advocates today, number one would be diversity. What do they mean? They mean racial, sexual, and economic diversity. That's a social justice issue. Child care is a huge social justice issue. Um, they say that everyone has the right to child care. Uh, I thought if you had a mother, you had child care. But nonetheless, uh, uh, child care, uh, because some people can't afford child care and some people uh, can, the, the social justice advocates advocate for universal government-sponsored child care for pre-K. You hear this a lot, universal pre-K. You hear it all the time. How about this? This is one I didn't even realize was going on. It's called climate justice. Climate justice. Uh, one leader in climate justice, her name is Mary Robinson, she wrote this. Now, I hope you can catch this and you don't. Climate justice informs us how we should act to combat climate change. We must ensure that the transition to a zero carbon economy is just and that it enables all people to realize their right to development. This requires that the global community acts in solidarity and ensures that the necessary resources are available to allow all countries and people to make the transition to clean renewable energy on the same time scale. Now, that's a lot of words, but basically what that person is advocating is that uh, climate justice demands that we throw all the wealth of all the world into one big pot and then equalize all the countries around this idea of climate change. And then there's refugee justice. Refugee justice simply means open borders, that uh, there's no such thing as borders. Creating affordable housing, we're told, is social justice. Uh, the way to do this, according to these activists, is that the government confiscates money from people who have more and then redistributes it to people who have less. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the classic old movie called uh, Shenandoah with Jimmy Stewart. If you haven't, you've missed the greatest movie he's ever made. But... Uh, there's a, there's a portion in that movie where uh, the state of Virginia comes to Jimmy Stewart, the character he plays, and, and says, uh, uh, we want to buy your horses. And he said, well, these horses are not for sale. And he said, well, I think I need to warn you that uh, uh, the state of Virginia has given us the authority to confiscate horses that are not for sale. And Jimmy Stewart's son is standing there, and he says, Paul... What does confiscate mean? 
He said, it means steal. That's what it means. <laughs> and it still means steal. Uh, but, but, but how is this, this social justice to be achieved? Social justice proponents say that it cannot happen without the strong arm of the government leveling the playing field. And therefore, in order to have real social justice, we have to convert to a socialistic government. And the problem with social justice is obvious. It fails to consider the multitude of factors as to why some people have while other people have not. One obvious thing is individual talent and giftedness. Some people actually try harder than others. Uh, that's why they have more and others have less. Uh, uh, then there's personal responsibility and personal behavior. Some people have because they behave themselves and act with decency and, 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 and righteousness. Other people don't have because they flitter everything they have away on uh, gambling, drugs, alcohol, and other such things. And is it right to take money away from hardworking people and give it to lazy people? Well, you know as well as I do the answer to that. When I was a boy growing up, uh, we had a benevolence ministry at the church I was going to. And we had a family who lived down the street and had a house full of kids, and, and they, were, they, were, uh, they were in need of food. And so our church was taking food to these people and feeding them. But they noticed that there was a man in that house who was able-bodied and yet refused to work. And so our church, when they delivered food to this family, they took it, they set it on the table, they said the blessing, and they let everybody in the house eat except for that man. Because the Bible says, if you refuse to work, you ought not eat. And that's biblical justice. There, there's another question. Who's going to make sure that once the government seizes total control of all the resources such as housing, child care, health care, energy, food. How do we know that the government will redistribute this in a just way? Well, history gives us the answer to that. Because everywhere it's been tried, it's been anything except justice. Look in the for former Soviet Union. The elites lived well, but the pe peasants starved. Look about in Cambodia. How about Venezuela? One of the richest countries in South America. And today they're eating their own pets and can't find toilet paper. And that's, that's a serious problem. Uh, go to Cuba. Why do you think people in Cuba and Venezuela are trying to flood into the United States? It's because they're fleeing communism and socialism and social justice so that they can have real justice. One thing's for sure, that the only equality that ever arises out of this so-called social justice movement, the only justice that ever arises out of it is that everybody becomes equally poor. And that's how it works. And so, social justice is one of the hottest, most influential topics amongst young people today. College campuses foment with this social justice idea. This, this is a dangerous Marxist movement, and it even drives the national policies today. The riots in the streets that we all witnessed last year, what were they crying for? Social justice. The defund police movement comes out of a social justice mindset. And these self-righteous social justice warriors feel justified in looting, in rioting, in destroying public property because they believe that they are standing against systemic injustice. Joseph Stalin was a social justice preacher until he rose to power. And when he had full control of the government, he set out to 
mass murder 40 million people. Is that justice? And the Chinese communist government rose to power preaching the gospel of social justice. But they are responsible for upwards to 100 million people. And this is no significant, insignificant matter in our culture today. The social justice movement is not, a, is not biblical justice. They often use similar words, but they say toad and they mean toad. You see what I mean? And so we need to understand what they mean. We need to look at the social justice movement today is a diabolical, twisted, counterfeit perversion of biblical justice. And sadly, everywhere it's been tried, it always produces poverty, injustice, and death. And so uh, we hear this all the time. We need to uh, be aware of what's being said. So how does it differ from biblical justice? Let's look at biblical justice for a minute. Let me give you two or three things. Number one, biblical justice is demanded by the Lord in his word. Biblical justice is demanded by the Lord in his word. Let me give you two or three verses. Number one, the verse I read, the text. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I read to you in Jeremiah where Jeremiah says, Go down to the house of the king and speak there this word. Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, who sits on David's throne, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Thus saith the Lord, Do justice and righteousness and deliver the one who's been robbed from the power of his oppressor. Do not mistreat or do violence to the stranger, the orphan, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood. And so, let me just point out something about this text that I read to you in Micah and where it starts. If you read closely this text, and I'll, I'll let you do that, but begin in verse 1 and read all the way down through verse 8, what you'll see is the prophet begins with an indictment from God to the people. And he asks them some rhetorical questions. He says, what did I do that you have forsaken me? How have I wearied you? Uh, in other words, what God is saying through the prophet Micah is, I have a covenant with you. We have formed a covenant. And the basis of the covenant that we have is the law of Moses. And the problem was the people had broken the law before God. They had broken their covenant with God. And so in one sense, what God is saying, to do justice means to do what God's law says. Now, before we get on this plane with one another, we've got to get justice right with God. You see? And so there's two ways of looking at that, and both, uh, and as a matter of fact, you don't do justice with others if you're not right with God. And uh, so biblical justice demanded in Micah is justice between man and God. The law of Moses required that rulers give those who are weaker the justice they deserve. Why? Because God, who is stronger, gives justice to the weaker. The widow who was powerless over somebody who's trying to rob or oppress could go to the law and there they would, or the court, and they would receive fair justice. Now God established laws and authorities to ensure fair treatment for everyone. Listen to what he says, Deuteronomy 1.17. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear, listen to this, you shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not fear man, for the judgment is God's. Biblical justice demands equal standing before the law. 
He said you're not supposed to favor or give partiality to the poor, the rich, the weak, the great. Treat everybody before the law equally. And so, social justice, instead of giving people equality before the law, instead requires equal outcome. Have you noticed they're not talking too much these days about equality, but they're talking about equity. There's a huge difference. And so, social justice demands equal outcomes based on prejudice, prejudice, or social standing. Judges are to prejudge a case based on the person's background or ethnicity or sexual preference. Prejudging is the definition of prejudice. But when the Bible says no partiality, it means no partiality. True justice demands that judges treat the great and the poor equally. It's unjust to give preferential treatment to a rich person. It's unjust to give preferential treatment just because somebody's poor. Hear the small and the great. Have you ever seen the symbol in America of lady justice? The traditional visual symbol of justice is a blindfolded woman holding scales and a sword. The scales are for weighing right and wrong. The sword is to punish the guilty. The blindfold is to show that she is impartial, that she does not treat friends differently from strangers or high-ranking people better than the humble ones because she does not see them. But she's not deaf because she listens to all the evidence put before her. Justice. Social justice, on the other hand, is not blind. It does not treat the small and the great alike. It, 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 under social justice, people are lumped into categories, into oppressed groups and special interest groups, and they're prejudged based on these groups. In other, in, other, in other words, it's the Robin Hood syndrome. I don't know. Uh, when I was a kid, I liked Robin Hood because he had a bow and arrow. And uh, uh, I thought that was cool. When I got older and started thinking about Robin Hood, I didn't like it too much. Here's this guy in a pair of leotards robbing from the rich and, and, and giving to people. And I thought, that ain't right. You ain't supposed to rob people. And yet, there are people today who believe justice ought to be like Robin Hood. And so, biblical basis is just on the idea, I'm sorry, biblical basis is based on the idea that all people have equal standing before the law. That person should be righteous before God and right with his fellow man. Number two, biblical justice is demanded by the Lord between one another. Often you hear people talk about getting justice or demanding justice. Well, did you notice the text did not say go out and get justice? It didn't say demand justice. Notice what it said. It said to do justice. To do justice. The Bible wants God's people to do justice. To treat people right. Treat one another right. Psalms 82.3 says, Vindicate the weak and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. Proverbs 21.3 says, To do righteousness and justice is desired by God more than sacrifice. Doing justice is to demand what is right or to set things right. Justice is done when honorable relations are maintained between husbands and wives, parents and children, employers and employees, governments and citizens, and human beings and God. Justice refers to neighborliness in spirit and in action. Biblical justice requires that we do justice by obeying God and treating others with fairness. Jesus summarized biblical justice. The scribes came to him and 
they said to him, what, is, what commandment is foremost of all? And Jesus said, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. And that is biblical justice. To be right with God and to be right with your neighbor. And so God's word, biblical justice... God de de desires justice, demands justice. Biblical justice is demanded between the Lord and one another. Now get this third point and I'll be done. Biblical justice demands a penalty for lawbreaking. Biblical justice, from Old Testament to New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation, demands punishment for lawbreaking. The prophet says, God has shown you what he requires. It's not to bring rivers of ceremonial oil. It's not to bring multitudes of calves to offer a sacrifice. God wants you to do justice. God wants you to obey the law. It means to do what the law requires, both vertically, that is, between God and man, and horizontally, between man and man. When we fail to do justice, that makes us lawbreakers. Lawbreakers. Lawbreakers are guilty. And justice demands punishment. Listen to what the Bible says. James chapter 2, verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. What's James saying? James saying you can be mostly good, but if you're some bad, you broke the entire law. Can anybody in this room today say, I have never committed a single sin in my life? I didn't think so. I, I probably, is, can anybody in here say, I haven't committed a sin yet today? <laughs> probably can't even go that far. Well, what's the penalty for lawbreaking? The Scripture's very clear. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. That's what it says. The law of God, the law of God is stern. And justice requires that when God's law is broken, that lawbreakers are punished. And what is the punishment? The wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18.4 says, the soul that sins must die. And so that leaves all of humanity in a mess. We're all guilty lawbreakers. Every man, woman, boy, and girl who understands the difference between right and wrong is accountable to God. And where does that leave us? It leaves us as lawbreakers, and, and, and the law of God and justice demands punishment. And the law can't be changed. The law can't be altered. And the law can't be ignored. But there is another provision. And that's called mercy. Aren't you glad for mercy? Mercy. God has made a way to fulfill the law's demands and to still give mercy. God has allowed his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to stand in our place to substitute himself and to receive the penalty that you and I deserve and take the punishment 
the law requires so that you and I can receive the righteousness of Christ and be forgiven and have mercy before God. You see, Jesus was totally sinless. He had never committed a sin, and that made him a suitable substitute. And Jesus was put on trial. Jesus was pronounced guilty. And then Jesus was sentenced to death on the cross. Why? To take the punishment that my law-breaking demanded. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be made sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Boy, I'm really glad that Romans 6.23 doesn't start, doesn't end with the wages of sin is death. That part's in there, but it goes on to say this. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's good stuff. By dying in our place, Jesus paid the wages that our sin demanded. God's justice was fulfilled by punishing Jesus for our iniquities and thus allowing mercy to flow from the cross to every wretched sinner who calls out in sincere faith to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. At the cross is where justice and mercy kissed each other and you and I were given eternal life. Praise God. And you see... That puts the ball in our court because there is no other propitiation. There is no substitute other than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we preach that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. Have you asked Jesus to be your Savior? Have you allowed him to receive your punishment and received eternal life? By faith? Because you see, the pardon is there and the pardon is offered, but you must receive the pardon. In 1830, a man named George Wilson, he killed a government employee who caught him in the act of robbing the mail. Wilson was tried and sentenced to be hanged. The President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, sent Wilson a pardon. But George Wilson did a strange thing. He refused to accept the pardon. No, nobody, nobody could figure out what to do because up until that time, nobody had ever refused a pardon. And so Wilson's case was sent to the United States Supreme Court. Chief Justice Marshall wrote the opinion, and he said, quote, A pardon is a slip of paper, the value of which is, listen, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. And so... He was. You say, man, that guy's a fool. Well, maybe he is. But I tell you, someone who's more reckless than that is somebody who would hear that Jesus Christ died to pay the justice that our sins deserve and still refuse that pardon that's offered. And so this morning, if you've not yet trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would encourage you to do so right now. Right now. You see, the Bible talks about we can be justified just as if I'd never sinned. You can receive a full pardon 
based on what Jesus did for you, not based on what you do for God, but what Jesus did for you. And if you surrender your life to him and call upon his name, you will be forgiven, the slate will be wiped clean, and you'll get a new heart and a new life. And he says we are to do justice and to love mercy. The last thing I want to say is this. We who've been given a pardon have received mercy. We should also extend mercy and forgiveness to our fellow man. Would you stand with me, bow your head and close your eyes? Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Maybe you never received your pardon. It is offered. The Word of God is true. You can't earn a pardon. It is a gift, but it's available. You receive it by faith. So this morning, if you would like to be saved, if you'd like to be forgiven, if you'd like the guilt of your sin removed, and you're ready to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, you say a simple prayer like, Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I've broken your law, and I'm worthy of punishment. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross, died in my place, and today I humbly ask you to forgive me, and I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. If you said that prayer sitting in here or standing here this morning, would you share that decision with the rest of us? Would you just... In just a few moments, we're going to begin to sing. And if you just step right out and walk down here, we won't embarrass you. We don't, we don't make fun of anybody. We don't make you make a speech. We just want to know, and, and uh, we'll share that. We'll rejoice with you. And that way we can help you uh, to take a, the next step towards baptism and, and your walk with Christ. But then this morning, too, if you've received a pardon, do you love mercy? Do you extend mercy? Is there someone you need to extend mercy to? And Father, we pray, somehow, some way, whatever said here today would bring glory and honor to the precious and holy name of Jesus. For it's in his name I pray. Amen.